Welcome to Open Your Reality, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chad, and today we have a very special guest. Now, I usually say very special guest, but this time, I definitely mean it. His name is Grandmaster Wolf. He is a mystic. He is a hypnotherapist. He is a psychotherapist and counselor. And Grandmaster Wolf's high success rates in these therapies is due to his lifelong investigations into the mind. The Grandmaster has done some incredible things in his life, such as study in the remote Himalayan and Taoist monasteries in China, which we'll get into. He's also an expert in Kung Fu. He's a world explorer and traveler, and he gives talks around the world, among other things. Welcome, Grandmaster Wolf. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure being here, Chad, and thanks for inviting me. Just call me uh, GM, please. It's Grandmaster Wolf is a big mouthful. GM is good. <laughs> okay, GM. Well, I I definitely have some questions for you. Uh, your story is extremely intriguing, and I'd like to kick it off by asking you, well, I'd like to discuss your life and background before we get into your philosophy. I know you don't like talking about yourself. I've seen some of your videos. And by the way, my viewers turned me on to you. I, did, I didn't know you until they mentioned it, so I want to thank them. But many of my viewers are probably either not aware of you, or if they are aware of you, they don't know about your background and your history. And your website, you have a nice website, by the way, says that you were compelled to journey on the spiritual path since you were a boy. Some people like me got into it a little bit later in their 20s, but I think you were just born into this life on this journey already. And you also lived in temples in the Himalayas and the remote mountains of China. So my question is, how long were you in those temples? And can you tell us what life was like living in them? <laughs> nice question. Okay. Give me a second here. I was driven towards it for two reasons. First reason being by the age of seven or nine years old, I was having memories that weren't mine, adult memories, memories that I shouldn't have had as a child. That was one thing that kicked me off. And the other was I was, I grew up in a quite an abusive situation. And uh, a lot of my friends at school wasn't having the same abusive situation that I was, so that I questioned that once I started to realize that all life wasn't like my life. I had questions. What did I do wrong? Why is it like this for me, etc. So I started reading books. I started to uh, question the way I was being educated at school. I, uh, I had quite a different point of view at school. One of the first things I noticed, and long answer, I'm, I'm sorry. One of the first things I noticed at school was my teachers were telling me things and my mind was putting up my own understanding and my own meaning to the teacher's words, which meant to me that my teacher wasn't teaching me anything. I was adding my own meanings to the teacher's words, and therefore I wasn't really learning anything other than what I was teaching myself. So at a very early age, I started wagging school. It's an Australian term for truancy. I stopped going to school and I started going to the public library instead. A typical school week for me was three or four days long. The rest of the time I would go and educate myself. Where, I'm sorry, where, 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 are you, where are you from? I was born in Scotland, grew up a little bit in Britain and went to Australia and then from there to the Himalayas. Okay, so do you, is your accent a combination of all of those? <laughs> My, <laughs> I guess it is. I guess it is. If we were in Australia now, I'd probably start talking a bit like this, mate. But there you when, go. Yes. So, you know, if we were in, in Scotland, I'd probably start talking to you like that. <laughs> Depends where we are. I've never been to America, so the US, so I, I can't do that one. <laughs> um, anyway, your from there, great. very very quickly from there i started doing martial arts um like most people of my my age bruce lee was it 
heavily, heavily into Bruce Lee. Uh, what what, what age did you start martial arts? Oh, 10. Oh, okay. Mainly because I was being severely abused and I, I really wanted it to stop. And as a child, the first thing you think about is martial arts. Um, and that's what got me into that. But very, very quickly, uh, I had a great teacher. His, anyway, I had a great teacher in the Kung Fu. And he uh, very quickly pointed out to me that it was all about mind, not thought. And that's what kicked me off. And um, from there, he, um, he talked my parents into handing me over as a 10-year-old to him and uh, which they had no problem with, handed me straight over, and I went and lived with my teacher. Two years with him, and he introduced me to his father, who was more spiritually minded and deeper into the Kung Fu like you wouldn't believe, and he took one look at me and said, you're broken on the inside, and he sent me on my way to Tibet. That's the quick story. So I went to Tibet with a a silver tube with an invitation wrapped up inside it and I gave that to the appropriate people. I was met by a Sherpa. Sherpa looked after me for two weeks as we journeyed up the hills into the Himalayas. He dropped me off at a monastery and I was there for 18 years. How old, how old were you when you first went? 14. And so you were there, eight, you said 18 years? Yes, yes. So in, I was in, ordained at 14. I was, uh, but that's you, not young. That's not young over there. People give their kids to the monasteries at, you know, three, four years old. So, so where, where did you go from Australia to there? I went from Australia to there, yes. Um, I flew over through Bangkok and then into um, Nepal and then from Nepal over the border and up into Tibet. That was a bit of a, um, a legal journey because there was lots happening then. And um, did, did you make the journey by yourself? No, I, I made the journey on the airplane over there by myself, but I was met by a Sherpa and um, he took me the rest of the way. Wow. How, was, how, how, was how, long was, how long was the journey from where you landed in Tibet to where you had to go? Two weeks. Two, a two-week journey, was it by, like, walking and horse or? Uh, that was on foot for the first, uh, it was mainly on foot. We picked up two yaks on the way through, um, but that was mainly for his stuff. And uh, he had his own stuff going on at the time as well. His job was to make sure I stayed alive, which in Tibet isn't a hard job. It's, um, back then, there was very, very little uh, crime. It's very, very loving, wonderful people. The only crime going on at the time was the Chinese army. Um, but he made sure that I wasn't going to get lost and he made sure that I went to the right place. And um, he dropped me off at the gate and he didn't come in. He left me there. And I was there until oh, the late 80s, sorry, mid 80s, I guess, to begin with. You know, GM, I think we could have... Uh a whole hour long discussion just on your time in Tibet. It's, that fascinates me. One of the movies I really enjoyed, I read the book first, was Seven Years in Tibet. Ah. I love the book. Watched the movie with Brad Pitt. And I, it, have you seen it? Oh, yes. Is it somewhat accurate? Yes. <laughs> and you, and you, you, also, you also met the Dalai Lama, which we'll get into later. Yes, and, yes. I stayed there with him for a little while. Now, okay, so you so you arrive from you go from Australia to Tibet. You're 14 years old, and did did you have a, a fear because you left your parents and your your where you were living? You left everything you've known to come to this foreign place. Uh, what were your thoughts when you arrived there? Were you, was it fear? Was it uh, a sense of wonder or maybe dread? What were you thinking? I felt like I was home. That was it. Mm. it um, yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it, Chad. It's just um, I'm the same now. I, as long as I'm within this skull, I'm at home. Um, I'm very comfortable in myself, very comfortable wherever I am. Um, 
just in the last two years, I've lived in Australia, Croatia, an island called Kirk, um, Denmark, Germany, and I'm in Sweden right now. So home is where my feet are. You want to come to Florida, spend some time with me here, you know? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. You got the money? I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, I've got a, a, an extra bedroom for you. <laughs> Done. I will come over there. I'll come and visit. I'll show you some things that can't be done online. You would, I'm sure you would uh, love it. No, I'm sure that we could probably put together a little um, in-person talk for the viewers in the United States as well. Let's do it. We'll do a demonstration while I'm there. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about Tibet. Now, you said that you felt like you were home. Mm. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do a little divergence from my line here about Tibet, but do you, I know you believe in reincarnation, right? I've had experiences. I, I don't, I won't use the word belief. Okay. Cause I was wondering if, when you said that you felt like home, if you actually had past lives in Tibet where you were possibly a monk and that's why you felt like it was home. Ah, nice question. I see what you're getting at. Home, I was definitely a monk at some other point in time, definitely. The Dalai Lama, as you probably know, has memories of 14 different lifetimes. I have the memories of three. Uh, I didn't know this when I was that young, of course, when I first arrived there. But one thing that I learned, I need to digress a little bit to, uh, um, to clarify my answer. My later years in Tibet, um, in a monastery there called Chok Hong Monastery, which is in Lhasa, um, the capital city of Tibet, we were, at, while I was there at a meeting, we were attacked by Chinese soldiers. Um, this is actually, this a lot of footage of this actually online. If you're prepared to look it up, it's there. And our monastery was attacked. The monks were being thrown off the roofs. Um, there were quite a few monks from my monastery. Most of them were killed. There was three of us left. I have bullet holes across the top of my head. I have, uh, anyway, they tried to hang me. Uh, they put a rope around my neck and threw me off the roof. The guy who was meant to tie the rope off at the other end wasn't quick enough. And the rope let go and I hit the ground without being hung. Then when things settled down, uh, three of us were taken by the soldiers and we were um, tortured and interrogated with cigarette burns. And you may have noticed when I do this, none of my fingers touch properly. All my fingers were individually snapped, basically to get us to uh, renounce the Dalai Lama as a, a spiritual leader. Um, now to answer your question, about being home when i returned to australia to convalesce after all of that my master came with me at the time and he said to me that if i end up having revengeful thoughts hateful thoughts anything of of that nature towards these chinese i've completely wasted the whole time that i spent as a tibetan monk forgiveness and compassion etc and i understood what he was getting at and i saw that um the people that were doing the damage to us were scared of what would happen to them if they didn't follow orders they were um they were acting from their own programming and their own egos which is the same as their programming so i understood that so after I had convalesced, I went to China and joined a monastery in China for five years. Now, while I was there, I had the same feeling of being home. And the reason was, if you're in a true monastery with true practitioners, very quickly, they all reach the same state of mind, which is above the ego, which is the original state of mind, the mind that fills the universe, the universal mind. And that universal mind is just saturated with 
unconditional love, joy, awareness, and consciousness. Now, when everyone in the same room is in that same state of mind, everyone is the same. It's like being at home. There's no expectations. There's no bias. There's no racism. There's no hatred. There's no anger. It's just a wonderful state of mind to be in. And it doesn't matter whether you are in a monastery in Tibet or in China or in Bulgaria or Australia. If everyone is there for the same purpose and the same reason, it's all home. It's all the same. And it's wonderful. Honestly, if you could take Hitler and a whole bunch of nasty people and put them into one room together, if you could get them to rise above their concepts and their programming just for one minute, for that one minute, all of those people would be exactly the same as you and I for that one minute until mm -hmm. they delve back into their program and then they're um, whatever you want to call them. So home, that's why I call it home. That's why I felt at home. Makes sense? It makes total sense. Uh, I myself have always felt, I should say always, but uh, since I've been on my spiritual journey, I've had this compulsion to want to spend time in a monastery. And there was a monastery in New York called the Zen Mountain Monastery, a little bit famous among Zen Buddhist circles here in America. And I would go up there, especially during New Year's. It was called Session. And I would meditate, you know, going from, from the night into the, into the new year. Um, and I just love the whole community. And because when you go up there at that time, December 31st, the snow is falling outside. It's cold inside the Zendo. It's made of wood. They got the fireplace. Everybody's meditating. Everybody's has that state that you were saying. Maybe not that quite state because people would come up there just for session. <clears throat> but I felt... I also felt kind of at home there mm -hmm. and I've flirted with the idea. I would look at different monasteries. I don't care if it's a Trappist monastery or what kind of monastery it really is because I wouldn't go there wanting to follow the exact beliefs of whatever monastery I go to. It would be more of just to be at peace mm -hmm. and I would do whatever the monastery, if they were chanting, I would do it, whatever, just to fit, even if just for a week. And I still want to do it. It's still on my bucket list to try to, do one of these days, but there was a book. Are you familiar with a book called The Empty Mirror? Ooh, it rings a bell. I haven't read a book in 20 years. Okay. It was a book written in the 1970s. I believe it's by a Dutch man who is a little older than you. He was maybe, I think, early 20s. And he was among the first Westerners to journey from a Western country to Japan. And I believe he was in Kyoto. So it was similar to your story, except you spent mm. a lot longer. I think he did uh, at least one year in a Japanese Zen monastery in Kyoto. And he wrote a book called The Empty Mirror about it. And of course, there were a lot of uh, difficulties he had trying to fit in, but he did the best he could. And I have you ever thought about writing a book about your experiences? No. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Quick no, answer. Right. We, we, we don't have the book, but we have we have an open your reality interview with with the grandmaster right here talking about it. Do you do you talk much about it on on your own channel? No, I talk. <laughs> Why? I'm no. I'm just curious. I know you don't like talking about yourself, and I I know that in some spiritual circles. Uh, when you get to be a certain level, um, I am not this body, you know, I'm not this thing, I am nothing. I know that philosophy, but I think still a lot of people can learn some va very valuable lessons from your experiences. The videos that, okay, let me back up a little bit here. If anyone was to ask me if I would recommend books, and most of my students and clients do ask me if I can recommend books, out of the thousands of books that I've come across and read over the years in the past, there's only three that I would ever recommend to anyone. And the reason I would recommend those three is because they're not trying to teach you anything. The books are basically um, bona fide enlightened human beings talking 
to very, very, uh, uh, an audience of very dedicated monks and spiritual practitioners who are halfway there, for want of better words. And the book is written by someone who's just sat in the back row writing down the questions and writing the answers from the master. So you're basically a fly on the wall reading those particular books and you get your epiphanies from listening in to the conversation, not from being told something. So that, that's why I would recommend those. But outside of that, my, my need is to help people understand their own needs on a spiritual level. My need is to give people clarity and understanding. And if I just talk and write things, I'm just talking and writing things. I'm not asking any particular questions. So uh, most of my videos, I think, to be honest, I don't watch them. Uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at my own channel. Um, people ask me questions and I answer their questions as clear as I possibly can. And that's what the videos are, is just people asking me questions and me giving the best answer that I can give. Um, but generally speaking, truth is very easy. And once you have a clear understanding of it, answering any question can be quite easy, regardless of how deep the question may seem. I don't know if I answered your question then, but that's what came out of my mouth. Okay. Um, I'm satisfied with it. By the way, for, cool. for my viewers who are interested in seeing your YouTube channel, it's just Grandmaster Wolf. So you can find the Grandmaster's videos there. And your website is gmwolf.org, I believe. Yes. gmwolf.org. It's a nice, nicely put together website. And you can learn more about him there. So just want to state it now, just in case people want to check it out while they're watching this video. But um, so you were in Tibet for 18 years. Mm. You learned the language, I'm, I imagine. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> the, on, the, only, the only words I can remember now is disapani, which means sick belly. And that's uh, something that got drummed into me a lot because it happens a lot. How did you communicate? Did, did they speak, most of them sp spoke English? Uh, I see. The monasteries that I went to were not Buddhist religious monasteries. They were mystical monasteries. In all monasteries and temples, you have the, the religious monasteries and temples, and you have the mystical for different people. Um, I won't go into that too much, why it's like that, but it is. So I immediately went straight to the mystical monasteries. Very, very little was spoken. Yes, they spoke English quite well. Um, but most of the time, the whole point is to not use language, to not use your ego, to not use concepts. The very first rule on this path to truth is to stop forming concepts and opinions and judgments. What happens is everyone and anyone in the world, you will see something, you will form an opinion about what you've just seen, and then you will talk about your opinion. You will think about your opinion. Your opinion will cover over and superimpose itself over the truth that you first perceived. And therefore, over centuries, generations, people have just grown into the habit of replacing truth with opinion. So when, and from opinion, you will have judgment and from judgment, of course, is just horror after that. So very, very little was said. Everything is gesture. Um, everyone knew what they were doing. If you were meditating, no one would come and talk to you. Everyone knew if you were meditating, leave that guy alone. He's meditating. He's doing the most important thing that you can do in this monastery. Everyone knew when it was time to eat. Everyone 
there is no time to meditate the whole time you are there is meditation you watch yourself sleep you watch yourself wake up you watch yourself eat you watch yourself turning intent into thought processes you watch yourself go through the day and work you watch your ego interacting with the outside world the world of people you try to stay dead silent in the middle of all of this ego movement you have to allow your ego to work with the world amongst the world because the body you inhabit is a part of the physical world and it there are certain conditions that it has to deal with to do that spiritually you're not of this world spiritually you are of a different dimension so there's two of you there obviously there is the original mind that you are when you are born and then there is the ego the thought processor that gets developed and built up over time as you're growing up so the whole point in a mystical monastery is to reverse engineer that situation so instead of filling up this pristine clean mind with thoughts and opinions and labels and ideas you back up and you reverse engineer that until you get back to the original mind that you were born as so words teachings they are all a no-no teachings you, there are no teachings in the mystical realms there is pure observation and experience there's a uh, question D did you have were there any other foreigners any other people that were not tibetans there in the monastery you were and did you even if even if there weren't did you make friends did you have a best friend in the monastery or anything like that or somebody that you could relate to no no there, there was one other um foreigner i guess you could call him he was german and uh as far as i could tell he didn't speak very much english there was a lot of a lot of germans back then in those days were seeking through that method um but no i'm fortunately or unfortunately i'm not sure either way i i don't keep friends not not as not as a rule that's just the way it is i'm extremely happy by myself i love my own company i live on an island right now i'm about i don't know 50 meters away from the ocean which is frozen solid at the moment what what, what, what country i'm in sweden right now it's minus five outside a little bit cheery a little it's, bit different from the 80 degrees where i am right now yeah well that's lovely <laughs> um and I've always been that way. I grew up by myself. I looked after myself. I brought myself up. I taught myself. Um, and I'm still that way now. Now, when you were living at the monastery, did you have your, your own cell? And how big was it? And what, what was it like? Yes, I had my own cell. Um, there are two places to sleep, depending on your duties at the time. Um, one of my duties was to anyway was a funeral everyone has to do a year of funeral duties which is where you would um where i was you would cut up deceased bodies after their three days of going through the tibetan book of the dead with them uh, you would cut their bodies up and then you would ritualistically feed the different parts of the bodies to the um the vultures the giant vultures up there which is i know it sounds odd but um there's a lot behind it there is uh where there is death there is life basically that's what that's about so that's a whole different ball game that's just um tradition that you bring into your practice in order to appease the families the lay people this is what I mean by religious temples and religious monasteries. They are for the lay people who are happy having a belief and happy having these kind of things in their lives. Nothing wrong with that. 
as a mystic, you don't fall into religion. You go beyond the religion. You go beyond the belief system because the enlightened mind, the original mind, is beyond thought. It was there before you started filling yourself up with thoughts and ideas. Um, so when you, once, you, once you rise out of and above your thought process, there's no me, there's no you, there's no self or other, there's no good or bad, there's certainly no religious belief, there's no tradition, there is what you are, which is absolute emptiness. And emptiness is a thing. If there wasn't, if emptiness wasn't a thing, there'd be nothing to put everything in. So emptiness is obviously there because we put everything in emptiness. So emptiness is a thing. And the emptiness that you are is absolutely riddled, riddled and saturated with awareness and joy and unconditional love. Um, and that's what resides in that, that nothingness, that emptiness, that original mind. And that all gets covered over when you allow the ego to become the dominant factor between your ears. And that's the point. That's why I was there. That's why people do it, is to experience and know the original mind, where we come from, why we're here, where, what it's all about. And the answers are in that original mind, definitely. Do you think that um, monastery life would benefit anyone who is on the spiritual path that they should at least try it for a few weeks, a month, a year? Or do you think it's something only reserved for the people like you and the monks who were there who were looking to explore the really the deeper aspects of mysticism and spirituality beyond religion, as you say? So would you recommend the monastic life for the normal person that watches my channel who's spiritual, but they're still you know, a householder and they're still concerned about everything that goes on in the ego level. Absolutely. If you can just touch on in a monastery, if it's a monastery that has monks residing, you have the liberty of having someone there to keep you on track, even if it's only for a week. While you're there in meditation, if you start to wander off, if you're... Um, if your body starts to cramp and itch and you just start getting agitated, other monks can come along and just put their hand on your shoulder and just whisper something like, because your body is agitated, don't think that you have failed your meditation. If you are aware of and watching the agitation, you are still meditating. Little things like that give you epiphanies epiphanies that when you go back home and go back to work you can start watching your workplace as your meditation focus you can start watching what you do at work as a meditation focus some of the most famous monks that have become grand masters of monasteries usually start off as a dishwasher there's a very, very famous story, a true story about a, a guy called Kashyapa. And he was a dishwasher in one of these monasteries. And all he did all day long was just wash the bowls, wash the dishes, wash the chopsticks. That's all he did. And for five years, he just watched the bubbles. He listened to the squeak of his fingers going over the, the bowls. He watched the rainbow colors in the soap suds. He listened to the tinkle putting down the the plates the bowls he would feel the weight he'd be one with what he was doing no thoughts just being a master of washing dishes then one day the master the absolute master of that monastery he was going to die soon and he knew it so he called all of the monks 150 monks he called them into the great hall and he was going to announce who was going to be the next master and when everyone got into the hall Last moment, Kashyapa came through a doorway out of the kitchen, wiping his hands on a dirty rag, and then he just leaned up against the wall at the back and listened. The Grand Master just lifted up a tea whisk, you know, a bamboo tea whisk 
for t uh, mixing your tea. He held that up and then he put it back down. He didn't say a single word. Kashiapa just smiled because it was just something else he'd seen that day and went back to the kitchen. All of the other monks were arguing with each other. What did he mean by that? What did he do with the whisk? Why did he pick that up? And then the master opened his mouth and said, Kashyapa, the dishwasher, will be the next grand master of this monastery because he couldn't get caught in the trap of trying to think about what this whisk was all about. All the other monks got caught up in trying to conceptualize, but he did not. So I don't know why I told you that. Yes, I told you that because as a mystic, your work can be your meditation, your family can be your meditation, your beads can be your meditation, driving your car can be your meditation, your whole life can be your meditation. And that's you would learn that from spending a week or two with some monks in a real monastery. Some people, religious people, they need belief, they need to feel like there is something greater than them. They, there are reasons why people are religious. I'm not going to go into any of the reasons because it could sound derogatory and it's not. It's not how I want it to be. If you want to bypass religion, if you can see that belief is the opposite of reality, a belief can only exist in your mind, in your head. If it exists outside of your head, then it's a fact. It's not a belief. There's a big difference. If you're the kind of person that would prefer to turn your back on reality and replace it with a belief system, then religion is good for you. If you are more interested in and have the courage to live life without a belief system, then you are a mystic. That's the difference. <clears throat> Uh, what would you say your, I know you, uh, I was going to say beliefs, but after you just said that, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I guess your philosophy, what would it most closely align to? Would it be Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Hinduism, something else? Nothing like, but closest to Zen Buddhism. I thought so. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. And I, Taoism, I love Taoism is very similar. True. I do love the stories of the Taoist masters. Uh, there's, there's actually a beautiful book. I've talked about it before on the channel. It's called Graceful Exits, How Great Beings Die. And I think you're familiar with the book. But... It, it talks about great Zen masters who have died, and a lot of them do it consciously. It's called Ma Samadhi, and uh, the stories are wonderful. And I talked about a few of those stories on my other channel, Ben the Spoon. I don't really post there anymore, but if you want to see it, guys, there's a good video I posted over there. Maybe I want to repost it here and open your reality. Um, <clears throat> do you see yourself as kind of a Zen master for your disciples? No, I have no idea what I am. Um, the universe, okay. <laughs> if, you, if, if anyone out there has the ability to sit down in deep contemplation, which isn't the same as meditation, and contemplate the implications of the fact that the universe is, one, is a living thing, and it has a universal mind and it is in all things and all things are in it in exactly the same way if you consider a sponge at the bottom of the ocean you can say that the ocean is in it and it is in the ocean as well that's the case with the universe that's and that's what i am and that's what you are and that's what all things are so it's very difficult for me I'm to say what I am. I am. I am part of the universe that is obviously trying to work itself out, a universe that is who, 
a universe which its agenda is self-knowledge and to know what it is it's in all of us we all try to do it we feel it inside our hearts everyone all things are searching all things are loving all things are curious which points to we share the same life force it's curious it's loving it's caring of course there are a lot of um a lot of people out there would say oh but what about these evil people what about these nasty people what about those horrible people over there but yes if you they are that way because of the way they were brought up they are that way because of how they've been educated if you can change the way those people are thinking if those people were brought up in a loving caring atmosphere they wouldn't be horrible people so when i'm talking about people being in life being full of curiosity and love and compassion that is everyone behind their programming behind their ego everyone is like that therefore everyone has access to the enlightened mind everyone has access to absolute universal love but you got to get out of your program to make it happen so to answer your question i don't see myself as a, a zen master i i don't know what i am it doesn't matter i see things come out of my mouth and i see people smile i see things come out of my mouth and i see people become relieved and relaxed and that's why i get up in the morning i don't really um complicate it any more than that was that an answer it, yeah that's an answer i i know that um <clears throat> i i'm loving this interview and i'm sure my viewers will as well and i i think <laughs> you're the type of person that we can go deep very deep into into a lot of aspects of your life. And um, I could see definitely a, a second interview with you if, if you would welcome that. But I would if, love to. Sure, sure, because I know you're, you've done a lot today and it's late where you are. Uh, we'll do another 20 minutes or so. But if, for the viewers at home, if you have any questions watching this about the Grandmaster, please drop them in the comments section. The next time we get together, we can, we can ask them to the Grandmaster or GM. Um, for the beginner person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so let's say there's a, somebody that's watching this channel and they, they just got into spirituality or maybe they've been thinking about spirituality, but they haven't really done much with it. And they want to learn uh, how to advance. Uh, would you say that meditation is really one of the best things that they could do to start off? And if so, how much should they be meditating? I, I usually tell people if you could do 10 minutes morning, 10 minutes evening, that's that's a win. But what are your opinions, GM? Yes, meditation definitely is a, a good way to begin. Observe yourself. For instance, if I was talking to you, which I am, Chad, but in a different context, I would say to you, start watching Chad. Watch what he does throughout the day watch why he does what he does watch what chad thinks watch how chad feels when he thinks what he thinks watch what chad feels when he thinks different things and watch what he thinks when he feels different things and you'll start to see two things will happen you start to you start to use the atrophied original mind that you were born with you start to strengthen it you start to use it again rather than blindly going along through your life following your thoughts and the problems that your thoughts create in the world and for you you start to separate your average person their average life is totally influenced by and controlled by the ego so the ego your thought process is the dominating factor in here and that makes life very difficult to be spiritual uh, wrong wording 
the spiritual life is to reverse that engineer so that beautiful pristine clean mind that you were born with before it was filled up with labels and opinions and concepts and laws and rules and traditions and all the other shit that fills up that beautiful little head that was born as a baby the trick is to get back to that let's say this is the pristine clean pure mind that is born in a baby and here you have thoughts people are putting thoughts into that little head this is good that's bad that's not good she's bad you shouldn't go over there he'll hurt you don't eat that that's a bad color this tastes great you should eat more of those don't eat any of that brush your teeth by the time you're 10 years old this has grown up to be the dominating force over this pure pristine clean awareness and then this gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you become older and overtakes it now the awareness it's still there but it is long forgotten and that this guy here we have to bring it back out and bring it back up so it is once again the dominating force and your thoughts are down here somewhere they don't come up and rule everything they just sit there until you need them and when you need them you will bring your thoughts up and use them to speak to people to fix your car um, for cooking dinner you will bring it out for things like that but it will be much smaller because it won't be full of opinions and hatreds and biases and laws and traditions it will just be there to do what it's there to do which is to help you navigate your way through the physical realm of men and women the physical world people so by watching chad go through his day by watching chad thinking what he thinks by wa watching chad feeling what he feels when he thinks what he thinks you will start to see your ego controlling your life but eventually when you can maintain that position of mind we are watching your ego control your body in the world of men and women you can pull it up and you can stop it when you see it doing something unwise and you can interject spiritual wisdom into what it says and what it does and this is how you integrate spirituality into the world of matter mm. um, <clears throat> I've known about what you said for a long time because when I was in my early 20s, I read a lot of books on Taoism, Zen Buddhism. Uh, that it said to observe, you know, just observe your breath, observe your life. Yes. So I've done, done that for a long time. <clears throat> I'm very self aware of myself, um, my thoughts, uh, my feelings. And I can just put it like this. I play a lot of tennis. There was a great book written in the 1970s called The Inner Game of Tennis. I believe it was by Timothy Galloway. And he said that he kind of related tennis to Zen Buddhism or to Zen. He said, when you play tennis, you have two people, really. You have the, the coach, the person that says, says, come on, go faster, you know, hit harder, be better. And then you have the player or A and B. And so the they're really two separate they're not really but when you play tennis you'll notice that you might give yourself commands but it's very difficult to carry out those commands right the coach always knows what to do but the player can't do it and for playing tennis so long and knowing about that book it used to be very different for me so i'd have the coach and the player very very different but since i've been playing for such a long period of time they've kind of merged yeah where i no longer have to talk to myself i no longer have to say things every once in a while when i go off track i might but they've kind of merged and i was just wondering what you think about that is that something that happens eventually to someone who meditates long enough and is observant of their thoughts what you just explained is the true meaning of kung fu it's a perfected skill a skill whereby you have done it so much you don't have to think about it anymore you can hand it over purely to the ego um, a wonderful line in one of bruce lee's movies he was talking to his master in in the monastery um, 
I probably get this wrong, but I think it was Enter the Dragon or something of that nature. <clears throat> his master was pointing out how Bruce Lee's character was using his spirituality in his Kung Fu. And Bruce Lee said something like, when my opponent contracts, I expand. When my opponent expands, I contract. And when it sees a window, it hits all by itself. That's what he's talking about, what you just mentioned. He sees the miracle that the monkey, you can actually let the monkey, once you've trained it and once it's obedient to spirit, you can let it go and you'll be amazed at what it can do. Kung Fu can be anyone that can control their vocal cords, an opera singer, for instance, who, without thinking, can just hit any note from absolute top to absolute bottom of the scale. That's a form of Kung Fu. It means perfected skills. There is a, a book called Higher Martial Arts, written by two Chinese guys. And what they're pointing out in that is, and this is the martial arts I was learning in the Chinese temple that I was in. When you go to throw a punch, you be aware of the intent to make that movement, which is invisible. It's just an intent. But you watch it. You be aware of that intent. You will see that then jump into the physical realm from the dimension of spirit. Your intent can jump into the realm of matter. At that point, it's in your brain. This happens in a trillisecond, of course. Your brain will turn that into a picture form, an idea, by using electrical impulses and chemicals in your brain. It will create the thought. That thought will then instigate the correct electrical impulses from there, from watching that. If you're punching right, you will see your right heel, per se, come off the ground and you'll see muscles in your legs starting to push forward. You will notice and realize that the first movement of a punch is actually way, way back inside your brain. But on the physical realm, the first thing that moves is actually your foot. Very few people notice that unless they're professionals. So your foot will move. Your calf muscle will contract. Your thigh muscles will move. Your obliques will turn your body and your hips. Your hip flexors will move. Your front deltoid will start to pick up your arm. Your triceps will contract in order to throw the arm out. Your trapezius will come into it. And then your lats will also come into it in order to throw that whole punch. That's using your Kung Fu as a meditation on the deepest levels. That's higher martial arts. That's doing martial arts to find your way to enlightenment. It's the same thing. It's um, stillness in action, being absolutely still deep inside whilst watching this torrent of movement on the outside. Inside and outside are bad words because they imply a separation. But for this discussion, we have to use these words. So, yes, I can't hear you. Sorry, have you ever seen the movie The Last Samurai? Oh, yes. Yeah, one of my favorites. Love Tom Cruise. Love the whole concept of that movie. There, what you were talking about when, we, when you started your answer. So Tom Cruise in that movie, he's um, captured by the samurai. And actually, um, instead of imprisoning him or, or torturing or, or taking him out, they actually use his knowledge to find out more about the white man. And he becomes very good buddies with the, the head of the samurai. And he's taught the ways of the samurai. They actually take him in as one of their own eventually, and they teach him sword kendo, sword fighting. And he they show him training. And when he's thinking about it, he's thinking hard about what he has to do when he's training, he ends up losing most of those battles. But there was a time after he learned enough where he was attacked and he was attacked by people that were the Japanese who were against the samurai and he was caught in a situation where multiple attackers came at him 
And you can see that he cleared his mind and he used the Zen mentality to fend them off and uh, successfully defend himself and win the fight against multiple attackers. So that's what I liked about the movie. It showed the progression stage from beginner to master. Mm -hmm. So that was a good scene to demonstrate it. But I'm also a huge Bruce Lee fan. I've read a couple of Bruce Lee biographies. I've watched every one of his movies multiple, multiple times. And um, I think it's all, we all feel it's an incredibly sad thing. He passed away. He passed away in 1973, the same year that I was born. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that he would have made a lot more amazing movies. Interestingly, did you know Jackie Chan played in Enter the Dragon as well? He was uh, just one of the people that got beat up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. Have you seen the movie um, Shaolin, where Jackie Chan is the um, the cook? I don't know if I've seen that one, or if I have, maybe just clips of it. But it, it, it's um, an epic film. I would highly recommend it. Okay, I I, I like Drunken Master. That's my favorite. Have you okay. seen that? One? Uh, not not for the drinking, but just for the for the humor of the, of the movie. And yeah, yeah. And some of the kung fu. Uh, I think people don't realize that people like Jackie Chan and um, others like him that came out of the, the Shaolin temples, they were living a life somewhat similar to your time in the monastery, except they put a lot more emphasis on the physical skills. Mm. Now, were you doing martial arts when you were at the monasteries as well, or is that something you took up? Or I know you took it up when you were younger, but did you? put that on hold when you were at the monasteries and took it up later in life? Or did you actually practice Kung Fu when you were living at the monasteries as well? The monasteries that I, I started Kung Fu earlier before I went to the monasteries. That's how I ended up getting to the monasteries. So I learned the basics and um, I learned enough exercises to last me at least five or 10 years without a teacher. I practiced that when I was in Tibet. That was my form of moving meditation. Um, Shinto is a similar thing. Anyway, that's off track. When I was in China at a place called Leifa Mountain, and my monastery there was called Dao Xin Monastery, which means the way of no center, no ego, no mind, no heart. You can interpret it many different ways, but it's basically the, the way of living with no ego, is, I guess, is the best way to explain that. So I was there five years, and that's when I got into what I guess you would call um, monastic kung fu. And monastic kung fu is purely designed for internal strength, spiritual strength, chi strength um and self-mastery it had very very little to do with combat it's purely about self-mastery there, there's a situation and i'm going to bring up christianity here for a moment in christianity one of the greatest things that they aim for is to get the ego to relinquish all responsibility and allow Christ to come into their life and live through them. In the same way, and that's uh, I hope that's the mystical approach in Christianity, in the same way, in all the monasteries that I've trained in, including the martial arts of the Chinese monasteries, were all designed to have your ego and your body submit itself to you, to give itself over to you, to the higher mind. Higher mind is the wrong wording because it implies a separation. Original mind, the Buddhists call it the Bodhi, the Bodhi mind, B-O-D-H-I. But that's the original mind, the mind that is in all things. Now, to allow that higher mind to totally dominate life again and overtake your life as a human being and live nothing but spiritually, spiritually, you have to convince the ego that that's going to be worth it. You have to convince the ego to give over to that. 
And it's very difficult, especially if some people are narcissists, they're not going to want to do that. Many people get onto this path because they want to be special in the eyes of others. Many people want to get onto this path because they want the authority to be a teacher to others. They, um, they will all fool themselves and say, oh, I'm doing this for the good of humanity. Well, they're not. They're doing this because they, they see themselves standing in front of a billion people going, oh, my God, look at you. You're so clever. Not everyone, but a lot of people do it for these reasons. So to get it to give itself up to you, to get the ego to just shut up and allow the spirit to come through can be quite difficult. It's a matter of, there's actually a name for it. It's called retreating from the edge of the cliff. And what happens in meditation, people hopefully will realize that outside of thought, you're not male, you're not female, you're not a father or a mother, you're not American or British or Australian or Bulgarian. You are nothing that your concepts would try and pretend that you are. And once you relinquish concepts, you realize and experience that you are nothing. And that doesn't mean you don't exist. You are a no thing, the original no thing that produces everything. That's what you are. Now, when most people reach that point, they get scared of non-existence, scared of not being special anymore, scared of being nothing. So they immediately fill that nothingness back in with ideas of self and specialness and me, me, me. And um, they retreat and then they will join something that has more belief in it to make themselves feel better and comfortable about life again. How the hell did I get onto that? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it's... It's all valuable information. And, oh, good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to do a, like a, a two-minute meditation thing and I'll just show you the meditation that I do? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. It, it's Tell me if you don't want to do this. So I'll talk for about two minutes. Okay. And then, um, I don't know, give it another 15 seconds and then just open your eyes. Otherwise, you'll be just sitting here and it'll be dead air time. <clears throat> and that's not going to work. I need you to close your eyes, please, Chad. Okay. Now I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes. Now you don't need to sit in any strange positions for this. When you do this, you just need to be comfortable. You can do it laying down. You can do it laying on a bus bench. It doesn't matter. You just need to be comfortable. Take a deep breath and relax everything. Allow your guts and all your internal organs just to hang off your rib cage. Let everything relax. And now just have a peaceful mind. Now, what you'll notice in the blackness is movement. Certain parts of the blackness won't be the same as other parts of the blackness. And there'll be movement in there. The trick is not to move. Don't respond to it. Don't allow your gaze your internal gaze to follow the movements allow them to be there but pay them no other attention other than you know that that movement is there somewhere in the background you might notice yourself chattering away am i doing this right what's this going to look like outside am i in the right position here am i breathing correctly pay no attention just let it chatter away some people will see colors coming and going and colored shapes coming at them and going. Once again, whatever you are in there, knowing that this is all going on, don't move. Just sit back in the blackness, allow the movements in the blackness to move, allow the chattering to go on in the background. Occasionally, you'll notice that your mouth will smile at what the chattering is doing as it's pretending to be you. But allow that movement. Don't try and do anything about any of it. Do not respond. Allow all of that movement to go on. Know that it is there, but you yourself, deep in there in the blackness, do not move. And if you can hold that non-responsiveness, 
absolutely for one minute you will have the deepest realization the deepest enlightenment and reality will hit you like a truck for one minute if that's not happening you are still moving and responding in there that is meditation so i'll leave it up to you as to how long you want to stay in there that's where you need to go when you said uh you might smile or, or laugh you know at the chatter that that happened maybe 45 seconds before that when you're saying it when you said don't don't pay attention to the chatter and i was i was kind of smiling i was like yep <laughs> but I, i've i've done meditation uh, a lot over the years so when i do close my eyes i really don't hear any chatter and I think a lot of people, just when they, in their daily life, there's a lot of chatter going on in their mind. And I think that drives people crazy. And maybe some people just are used to it already. But I, I, can, I can have a very blank mind. So sometimes people might say to me, what are you thinking? They think I'm lost in thought, but I just have a, a blank mind. Just very Wonderful. Blank. Yeah. yeah. Of, of course, there are times when I'm using my mind, like I had a, a little business meeting with my friend earlier virtually and we were talking and then i'm thinking about things but it's it's cool to when you want to use your mind it's a tool and when you want to just have it blank you just let it be blank and you don't have to have that monkey mind chatter that annoys everything oh, that's wonderful well done my friend the reason i brought it up chad is because a lot of people make the mistake of seeing that their thoughts have wandered off and therefore they have failed at their meditation and that's not the case if you've noticed that you've wandered off you're still meditating people think that it's a matter of stopping your thoughts and that's not the case your thoughts will stop on their own but don't try and stop them you don't need to it's not the thoughts you are trying to still it's the mind that you are trying to keep still your thoughts are part of the brain they're not the same thing you are whatever you are in there that is aware of your thinking. Consider this. If you know when you're thinking and you know when you're not thinking, then knowing has nothing to do with knowledge because that's thought. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a good quote. I think it's a good way to end off. And, uh, you know, GM, I really appreciate you giving me the, the hour plus. I think my viewers are going to be very, very happy with this interview and clamor for more. So we'll talk off camera about setting up a second interview because they were like, I, I think I only asked you four or five of my many, many questions. So uh, just tell tell viewers uh, where they could find you or anything, any plugs or anything you want to tell them about you just to end the show. Um, I think you've already done that at the beginning, Chad. There's, there's nothing else. I have no books to write. I... <laughs> i'm sorry the gm has no books he has no courses and, uh basically you well he does have a website and videos so i definitely want people i want people to check out your youtube channel which is just your name grandmaster wolf and i believe your website is gmwolf.org yeah, yeah. gmwolf.org check it out it's a good <laughs> website and we'll have the gm back on if you have any questions for him just drop them below and I will put the links to your YouTube channel and your website below. So you guys for convenience can check that out in the description. Thank you so much for joining me today, GM. I'm looking forward to our second interview. Absolutely. My pleasure, Chad. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me here. Thank you for watching the entire interview. I did a video on Patreon with the Grand Master talking about how he acquired his powers of telekinesis. If you're interested in watching it, head over to my Patreon page now to see that video and many others not posted here on YouTube. 
the link is below. I appreciate you all, including the people who've got my back by providing financial support. If you'd like to make a donation to the channel, links are below as well. I talked with GMW about doing a second interview, and that will happen two weeks after the airing of this one. Alright, see you in the next video, and of course a big namaste.